Good afternoon, welcome. everyone. This is Joyce Fair from Heritage Ohio, and I want to welcome Jonathan Sandvik, who is our title sponsor for the conference. Thank you very much to Sandvik Architects for your sponsorship, and take it away, Jonathan. It was my pleasure, uh, Joyce. Thank you for your hard work. You've done an exceptional job, and it's certainly my pleasure to be able to support this uh, tremendous effort. And thank you, too, for all those heroes out there working in your communities. Uh, you're so important to our future, particularly here in Ohio. So with that, I'd like to introduce our speakers today. Uh, first is Sharon Woods. Uh, she is from the firm of Land Use USA um, the Urban Strategies. And Sharon has nearly 20 years of experience in professional consulting, preceded by 12 years of working for Fortune 500 retail corporations, including Target, Macy's, Sears, and General Motors, to name a few. Sharon had left corporate uh, America in 2002 and began advising downtowns on ways to compete with big box chains and founded Land Use USA in 2008. And with her is Karen Norris. And Karen okay. uh, is with RIM Urban Fast Forward and she is a principal and broker. And uh, Kathleen is a specialist in urban real estate and revitalization. She made her entry into the practice area in 2007 as a leasing consultant for Gateway Quarter in the Cincinnati's historic Over the Rhine. Prior to becoming a realtor and consultant, Ms. Norris was an art industry executive for more than 30 years. And we are very glad to have them here today. Please welcome Kathleen and Sharon. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. Good afternoon. And Jonathan, would you like me to just jump into the presentation then? Yes, please start. Yeah. Okay, can you hear me okay, everybody? Yes. Someone give me a clue that you can hear me. Yes. Yeah. Perfect, thank you. So welcome everybody and thank you for again for joining us today. I am gonna talk for about 20 minutes and I have some slides and some data that I'd like to share with you. And then when I'm done, I'm gonna flip it to Kathleen and she's gonna ask me some questions. Um, she's familiar with this slide deck and familiar with the information because we've presented it together before, but she's gonna stir things up a little bit with some questions. And then hopefully we will also have time for your questions near the end as well. And this first slide that you can hopefully see, I realize everything is portrait because it is a PDF document um, rather than a PowerPoint presentation. And the first slide shows three articles that I wrote for the Congress for the New Urbanism and their public square journal, which is the PSQ that you see and you can see back in 2019, before COVID-19 hit us, I was already writing about this topic, that retail, the retail apocalypse is a myth, um, and then really addressing strategies for downtown merchants. And then the third item came in after COVID hit us, and really starting to address some of the things that we can do to adapt after, um, after COVID-19 particularly in the retail industry. So we're, what really spurred this, um, these articles and these presentations back in 2019 was I was seeing so many articles, news articles, you know, the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times talking about this retail apocalypse. And it really became kind of part of the mainstream dialogue. And I really wanted to provide real data and information to show um, you and, and our communities that retail is not dead and that this retail apocalypse really is a myth. I will clarify to say that we all know instinctively that retail is going through a, a very major transformation right now and there and is really struggling to adapt to shifts in the market in, including consumer preferences, online sales, and then these sorts of these sorts of economic crises that can hit us as part of a pandemic 
Um, these are all really tough challenges. And so we recognize that, you know, we need to be nimble and we need to adapt and, and be um, able to be diverse and resilient. Um, and certainly some industry sectors are contracting, and I'm going to show you what those are. And certainly the internet is taking a bite, but I think it's a really extreme to say that there's a retail apocalypse because that implies that retail is dead and it's far from dead. Brick and mortar retail in particular is here to stay. So I'm gonna jump to the next slide. Hopefully I can, uh oh. There we go, my computer was a little slow. So hopefully you're seeing a slide with a histogram at the top and a pie chart at the bottom. The top chart shows the share of income that Michigan's residents are currently spending on retail trade and historically. So in 2019, which is the far rightmost chart, in Michigan, the average, reach, the average person is spending 50% of their income on retail, and this is brick and mortar retail, including brick and mortar non-store sales like catalog sales, phone sales, and a little bit of internet sales. But it's all done by a brick and mortar establishment. You can see with the three red charts, red um, bars, that there was a uh, an impact during the Great Recession, and we're going to see another impact like that, maybe even a little deeper when we come up, when we have data that reflects um, what's currently going on with COVID. So we're going to watch that carefully. It's going to take a couple years for us to, to get that data. The pie chart shows the same data for 2019, but broken down into categories. So you can see 44% of total spending is on these brick and mortar establishments, which includes motor vehicles and parts, which are big ticket sales, furniture, electronics. You can see the list. It includes all grocery sales, apparel sales, gas sales, general merchandise. Um, you know, everything is in that category. And then those brick and mortar establishments also generate another 6% of sales. Uh, in non-store transactions on the internet catalog and phone sales. So restaurants add another 7%, that's the dark gray. And then 43% of our income in Michigan, and this is really, by the way, Michigan is so very similar to national averages. So we are really um, a good representation of national averages. So think of this as being almost national. 43% is spent on other expenses. Everything from debts, including student loans, our mortgage, car and payment, car payments, um, insurance, health care, savings if we can, um, college expenses, you know, everything else is in that 43%. So you can see how it might be very tough for some families to save money when so much of their income is needed to spend on retail. The next slide, I'm showing three line charts, and the green chart shows total brick and mortar retail sales, including non-store transactions and automotive, which is, again, if you imagine buying a car, it's such a big expense, it's a big ticket item. The blue line takes out the auto, takes out all car sales, campers, boats, you name it. And it also takes, um, also takes out e-commerce and mail orders by non-stores. And I want to show you with that red line that e-commerce back in the early 1990s was about 2% of total retail sales. It's now approaching 4%, 14%. And it's probably going through a real uptick right now. Um, I'm hesitant to even venture to guess how high it might have been during the worst of the pandemic. It could have been 50%, maybe 30%, 25%, I'm not sure, but I'm gonna be watching that data very carefully as it comes in. You can see from the blue and green lines that dip again during the Great Recession, and we're gonna see another dip again 
but these charts start to look a lot like watching the stock market. You know, we take a hit and then we slowly climb up out of it. And it doesn't mean that we don't resume, gro resume growth. And indeed, we continue growing. It might just take a while for us to recover. I'm going to break this data down, those line charts, particularly the blue. I'm going to break it down into some more detailed categories. So here's my first slide, which shows grocery stores, restaurants, and drinking establishments. So the blue line is growth in grocery store spending over time. And you can see it's continued to tick up tick, to tick upward slowly and steadily. And so when I look at this, I see anything but a retail apocalypse, certainly in the grocery store industry. And then restaurants, we're going to talk a little bit more about restaurants again later, but restaurants really help make up the difference where some retail categories are experiencing declines. And I'm going to show you that a lot of that difference is being made up for in restaurants. So consumers are shifting their spending away from things like office supplies, sporting goods, and apparel and spending far more steadily increasing their spending on restaurants. So you see the growth there. Now we're going to look at a couple of other categories, general merchandise. You can see that, so this is all of the discount department stores, Walmart, Target, what's left of Kmart. Um, we have Meyer Super Centers here in Michigan. All of that is included in the general merchandise category. A bit of a slowing since the recession, a slowed growth rate. So it was trending upward more strongly before the recession. What really took a hit was building materials and garden supplies. So that housing slump, the slump in the housing industry, really put the brakes on many households doing home improvement projects. They, they realized that they were suddenly upside down in their mortgage and really concerned about spending money on home improvement projects when they were upside down. So they, they tried to save money or spend less instead. Home improvement fortunately has um, recovered and is trending back up and maybe even making up some, some of the difference through deferred spending in that category. But when we look at the red line, this is the lackluster category, you know, clothing and accessories. It really is so flatlined. And this is what has the major department stores like Macy's very cautious and nervous about um, whether they can really, you know, grow their industry in the clothing category. And of course, there's lots of lifestyle changes that are impacting the way we spend on clothing. And we're spending far less on formal apparel um, for the office. Here are a couple of other categories. The red line is office supplies, gifts, and novelty. And the green line is furniture and home furnishing. So they have recovered some growth since the Great Recession. But what really took a hit from the e-commerce is electronics and appliances. So this is what has resulted in Circuit City, you know, going bankrupt and Best Buy downsizing and a lot of these stores really contracting because they're realizing with this kind of flatlining, you just can't really realize any growth. And then sporting goods, hobby and books, these also are categories that are so easy to be consumed online and they've really taken a hit as well. So the important thing in all of this is that when we talk about a retail apocalypse, to really imagine that there are some categories that are flatlining and really taking a hit. Other categories are continuing to be quite strong. On this next chart, I'm going to start by highlighting the blue histogram. Um, the blue bars show the growth, the year-to-year -year growth in total retail sales for brick-and-mortar stores. So you can see in the early to mid-1990s, Retail sales were, you know, trending steadily, five to six percent growth every year. And in the early 2000s, we had a soft recession, and sales um, growth fell to three percent. And retailers were kind of nervous, but then it recovered. It got back to five and six percent. Then in the mid 2000s, and leading up to the recession of 2008, it slowed again. 
When we came up out of that recession, there was a little bit of deferred spending that helped us get back to a 6% growth. And since then, we've really slowed. And again, part of this is the impact from e-commerce. So we're now between 3 to 4 to 0 to 2% growth each year in brick-and-mortar sales. So that's soft compared to the 1990s. And you can see the impact was really from e-commerce, which is the gray bars. When e-commerce really took off in the 2000s, you can see that it was growing at 25% growth every year for, for five years. What I really want to highlight with the gray line, gray bars, is that the growth in e-commerce is slowing. And because of this slowing down, it will eventually hit this kind of plateau in terms of the growth rate. We believe in general, when I, when I say we retail analysts out there generally agree that pre-COVID anyhow, we were talking about e-commerce eventually being 30% of total retail sales and kind of settling down at, at that level. So about 30% at a plateau. And even with what's going on today with, with COVID, you know, I think that five years from now, when this is behind us, e-commerce will probably settle in at, at about 30 percent. These are my last couple of charts, and then I'm going to pass it to Kathleen. I have two charts that I want to show you. This first one with the red, at the very top, it says net store closing. So there are 52 chains that I was tracking for 2019 and 2020, all pre-COVID. So none of this was occurring during the pandemic. These are the chains that were closing nationwide. And you can see the real, the real bear in the group was Payless Shoes that was closing, you know, 2,600 stores. And so the media really hyped to that up. And then when Jim Barry announced that it was going to close 800 stores, and Dress Barn says we're going to close 650, and Office Depot comes in and says they're going to close 450, and the media just jumps all over this and really hypes it up and basically starts releasing news that we, we are in an apocalypse. If you add up everything on this chart, and I didn't, I tried really hard to not leave anybody out, so this wasn't selective. I didn't choose some retailers and exclude others. I tried to find every chain that was closing in the nation. And even down to Bloomingdale's was doing one closure and Lord and Taylor closing two stores at the time and Barney's closing 15. You add it all up and it's 7,529 stores. And again, the media was really hyping that up. If you add pay less, it was 10,000 stores across the nation were closing. What they didn't say was that this represents 1% of all retail establishments in the nation. So if you think about it that way, 1% closing, I'm not sure that that's really an apocalypse. That is brands being outdated, not keeping up with consumer expectations and preferences, consumers being very demanding and, and fickle, and these outdated brands basically having to either figure out how to make their con customers happy, or if they can't do that, um, just contract and right size and make room in the market for other stores like this. So here are the net store openings in blue, 45 chains. This was the same period. And the biggest opener was CVS, followed by Dollar General, Dollar Tree, Old Navy, Big Lots. And we can talk a little bit more about how the brands have changed so much. So what was closing were these conventional apparel um, stores. And what was opening, what's really opening are the value stores, the dollar stores. The openings represent half of 1%. So this means that the net loss was actually just half of 1% for that two-year period. I have one more slide. Sorry, I lied. Um, this slide just talks about the halo effect of omni-channels. So one thing to think about with e-commerce is, you know, help, help us all kind of challenge this dialogue that e-commerce is evil and that it's bad. Because, in fact, brick-and-mortar retailers are starting to realize slowly 
that they can leverage e-commerce to their advantage. So a brick and mortar store can do great in sales, but they start to realize that, hey, if I offer online ordering and you can order here or even pick up the phone, make an order and then pick it up or we'll deliver it. If I start promoting myself on social media, maybe you can even make a purchase using your phone. Um, click and collect is basically order online and collect at the store that this cycle actually builds brand loyalty. Customers who can buy, who can shop this way, actually are more inclined to be loyal to that brand and far more inclined to actually go into a brick and mortar store and make an in-person purchase because that loyalty, that brand recognition has been built up. And what you actually get through this is, is the possibility of a halo effect. And the big box national chain stores out there have really grabbed onto this stores like walmart right now you know it's so easy to have product delivered to to buy and collect click and collect and that really is building um, more loyalty to that brand when we do get, go back into the stores we're inclined to gravitate towards the, the stores that gave us those choices so i'm going to stop there and i love this part i love flipping it to kathleen norris i know she's going to ask me <laughs> some tough questions and she's going to have some dialogue and Kathleen I will happily go back to any of these charts if you like go back to the and beginning she, what do you think back to the beginning oh my gosh yeah. I don't think I need I don't think uh Sharon and I have done this before where I have used her slides I think her slides are so exceptional and her data is so good that I decided that um I would simply um use her excellent work. So um, the next slide, if you don't mind, Sharon. Sure. There we go. This, this I think, is, a, is the first really interesting slide. Um, Sharon has pointed out that retail sales non-auto non um, are, are uh, crucial. And what you see here is that at no point on this slide, except during the Great Recession, is retail actually going down? It dipped in the Great Recession, but it continues to rise. It may rise more slowly, but a retail apocalypse would imply that it went down during the Great Recession and then it continued to go down. One of the things we know about the United States is that we are one of the most over-retailed, we are the most over-retailed country in the world. We have five times more retail than some other countries. Um, we have five times more retail space available than Canada um, on a per capita basis. So we are due for a correction. We are due for a right-sizing of retail. And yet, at no point, on Sharon's chart here, except during the Great Recession, does retail actually go down? It bifurcates a little bit with e-commerce picking up 13.5%, and I'll pick that up again later, but e-commerce continues to rise as well, including auto rises, not including auto rises. All category of retail continues to rise. Um, next slide, please. Um trying to get it to respond and part of the reason i don't do slides is that i am absolutely useless at this part <laughs> I um think I I got mean, it unbelievable interesting and 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 i want to set the stage with one other data point here which is starts to be relevant on this slide in 1950 or thereabouts the average american family every bite that family ate was prepared in the home there weren't hot school lunches. There weren't lunches out for dad. There weren't um, dinners in restaurants. Every single bite that most Americans ate was prepared in the home. Today, in 2020, 50% of our food spending is in restaurants. It might be the drive through at McDonald's. It might be a fine dining restaurant in your community, but 50% of the food we eat is prepared for, for us and purchased by us from restaurants. So here you see what's happening in food spending and what you see is that convergence. You see that 50% occurring 
in this excellent chart. We have grocery store spending continuing to rise. Part of that is the natural um, occurrence of price rises, but we also have restaurant spending growing at a very rapid rate, especially post-recession. And part of that is that the millennial generation and the succeeding generations want the experience of dining out. People have eaten at home during the quarantine that we are going through now, but increasingly you hear people saying, I'm tired of eating my own cooking. I want to eat in a restaurant. I'm going to eat more carry out. And I think when we come out of this pandemic, I think we're going to lose some of our good restaurants. And I think there is a real risk to that. I think we're going to have to watch our main streets because some of the chain restaurants that we have managed to keep out of our communities are going to look for some of those main street opportunities. And some of our landlords in need of money to pay their bills are going to be more receptive to those kinds of restaurants. But we also have the opportunity to have some of our younger chefs and our younger food providers backfill spaces. And particularly in the immigrant community, uh, the Hispanic community um, and others, they are always looking for ge second generation spaces because it's a way to control costs. So remember that 50% of our, our meals are now eaten in restaurants and that number continues to rise. Next slide. Um, this one I find really interesting for the dip in building materials and garden supplies, which Sharon highlighted. I think we're going to have a temporary uh, burst of um, uh, growth in that category, which I think will, will level off again um, because people are really attentive to those projects during the current quarantine period. So I think when she comes back to us with data about right the, the time we're going through right now, I think we'll see that green line have a little zoom in it, but the most interesting line here is certainly the red one, clothing and accessories, because that's what drove so much retail growth. And as we'll talk about in a minute, electronics, but fashion stores grew exponentially and they just decided that there would be no end in sight, that the, as fast as they could open them, they would succeed. And you have some chains, most notably the lower end chains, that will keep stores open for very little profit. There is a uh, Rainbow, if any of you are familiar with the Rainbow stores, Rainbow has, if I recall correctly, about 1,200 stores nationwide. They'll keep a store open for $10,000 a year. Their view is if we're making $10,000, if we're truly making $10,000, we're making money, keep the store open. Um, as neighborhoods change around them though, those stores become incompatible with their communities sometimes, and that leads to some changing. We, we have to consider that urbanization is changing some of our buying patterns, and I think urbanization is certainly a factor, perhaps not a decisive one, but a contributing factor in the closure of all those Payless shoe stores and some of those other retailers that Sharon pointed out. Um, but fashion, clothing and accessories, the red line here is uh, a real problem and that's the slowest growing line on Sharon's chart. That, that line is, is pretty darn close to flat. Um, next slide. Ex and this one, the interesting thing is electronics and appliances. One of the things that's changed is that we can get all that stuff now in the contemporary version of a department store. So the freestanding electronics and appliance store is really um, a dinosaur. And especially when it's a freestanding electronics store that might be 30,000 square feet in size, we can go into Target and get all that same stuff. We can go into um, Walmart and get most of that stuff. We can even go into some of the dollar stores and pick up some of the lower end, uh, big lots. Uh, might have some of the lower end of electronics and appliances. As we have become more, more familiar with that product, we have less needed the expertise of a specialty store. We have less needed the guy to explain to us, and they almost always were guys, the guy to explain to us what the comparative benefits are between one television and another. We've pretty much got that now. So we don't need those specialty stores, though I will say personally, I really miss Radio Shack. Um, and of course, mm -hmm. as Sharon pointed out, sporting goods, hobbies, and books, a lot of that stuff has gone online. Board games are big during the pandemic, but before the pandemic, who in this audience 
when was the last time you played a board game instead of an online game? Um, next slide, please. Um, I love this slide, and Sharon knows why I love this slide. Um, she points here to the fact that the growth of e-commerce is slowing. She says that she thinks that by 2030, e-commerce will have plateaued at 30%. I actually hear that data differently. I hear that by 2030, 70% of retail spending will still be in bricks and mortar. I think that's what we as Main Street developers have to be focused on. 70% of retail spending after e-commerce has plateaued, after everybody's done everything they can imagine in e-commerce, after all these stores have closed, 70% of retail spending will still take place in bricks and mortar. So I think that for me, and Sharon and I come at this from exactly the opposite side of the spectrum, for me, I think that is uh, the more relevant statistic. Um, next slide, please. Oh, I love this slide, and she knows this. Um, first of all, I'm going to talk about Payless. Payless closed 2,600 stores, and they have announced recently that they will be opening 300 new stores. So Payless has stabilized. And the first thing I'm going to say about store closings is that they happen a whole lot more quickly than store openings. When Payless closed 2,600 stores in one year, in a single year or thereabouts, they closed the number of stores that it had taken them 20 years to open. So the perceived impact of that, the actual impact of that, is a big splash. But it only happens once. Stores open year on year on year, 20 here, 15 there, 30 here, 40 there, 10, three. They close in great clumps. And that's why we get this idea of the retail apocalypse. We are right-sizing our retail. We were way over retail. We had five times more retail square footage than any of our nearest competitive countries. We have the fact that there are trends in everything, fashions in everything, including retail. So some of these stores, and Sharon pointed this out, some of these stores just lost their way. They just were old fashioned stores. Um, the grocery stores are, 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 are an exception to this, but grocery is an extremely price sensitive category. If you look at her first uh, store on the list is Lucky's Market, then you go down about a half a dozen stores. You've got Earth Fair Grocery. Um, I think there might be another grocer on this list. Grocery is an extremely price sensitive category. Uh, the Win Dixie Bilo. Um, the average grocery store can count on an annual profit if they're doing really, really well. If they're just killing it, they can make a penny in the dollar. If you're, a, you just, and as, as a grocer, this is a grocer's joke, I just have to turn a lot of pennies. Um, but if your margin is a penny in the dollar and you have misjudged your market, you are not going to make it. But also, the larger grocers, the Kroger's of the world, have been on a buying spree. And they have been refining their product mix so that they have been incorporating and cutting into a lot of the niches of the smaller grocers like Lucky's and Earth Fair. They're doing organic. They're doing a good job with produce. They're doing a good job with, with gluten-free and dairy-free and vegan. They've added all those categories. They're doing a, a, a reasonably good job with grab and go. They've got wine sections. They've beefed up their cheese selection. They have, they're, they're not crazy and they're not stupid. And they have just eaten in to the market for these smaller grocers. And when your margin is a penny in the dollar, you don't have a lot of room for error. But again, looking at that, uh, you've got some stores on there that are just old fashioned. Victoria's Secret. Victoria's Secret used to be an absolute category killer. I'm sorry, men, we're just not that interested in that stuff anymore. It's not that comfortable. And we've all kind of pivoted to a different way of dressing. And that has hurt Victoria's Secret. Um, pennies, some of that was operator error. Barney's, a lot of that was operator error. 
Um, there's a lot, any store that, any chain that has been the subject of a leveraged buyout in the last 10 years is vulnerable because those buyouts are basically a form of asset stripping. And at the, many of them, I won't say every one, but at the end of that, they're, those stores will not succeed. They did not invest in keeping them current. They did not invest in e-commerce. They did not invest in good merchants and good market understanding. They just ran them into the ground. Um, so um, it's interesting that Family Dollar is on there as closing 390 stores. And you would say, why did Family Dollar close 390 stores when one of the fastest growing categories is that that sector of Bargains, bargain general merchandise. Well, Family Dollar was purchased by another operator and they closed stores that were duplicated. So there are a lot of reasons here that stores are closing. But Sharon's most important point is the one she has in the bubble to the right. This is 1% of all our retail establishments. As she says, not exactly an apocalypse. Next step, slide. And this is the net openings. And what are you seeing? Groceries opening there. Um, I love tractor supply. Peloton, that's a new age business. Um, a lot of housing, a lot of home merchandise stores there because you've got a lot of millennials who have moved actively into family formation stage. You've got your niche grocers like Trader Joe's, um, Aldi, which is in the same family. Uh, that's their bargain. Um, uh, uh, product, whereas Trader Joe's is more their uh, gourmet product. CVS, you've got an aging population. CVS has been very smart. CVS made a decision they would not sell tobacco. CVS is putting little is putting clinics in a lot of their stores. Uh, CVS has also gone into a lot of neighborhoods and is serving as a pantry supplier for groceries. CVS has really beefed up its grocery selection, and you can get a whole lot of canned goods, a whole lot of box goods. You can get fresh milk. You can get some frozen foods. So CVS has been very smart um, about the way that it has grown. Um, also, I'm looking um, <coughs> uh, quick check convenience that can, Ace Hardware. Ace Hardware is a terrific um, uh, offering and it's an easy franchise and they've been growing their store based on that. So again, half of all retail establishments have opened in the period 2019 to 2020. So if we actually net that, our total net loss is 0.5%. Again, not exactly an apocalypse. Sharon, am I getting this right? Uh, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I think we, I think, you know, we mutually agree on the implications of most of this data and I like that you're diving into it a little deeper than I did. Um, you know, I want, I'm always sensitive to time and wanting to make sure I can get through the material and you're doing a deeper dive and that really helps. Um, I do see there are a couple of questions that are coming in. Kathleen, do you have anything that yeah, you let's want to? Finish, let's finish Omni Channel and then let's, let's, let's talk amongst ourselves. I think Omni Channel is <laughs> crucial and Part of what, and again, we are Main Street developers here. We are we are concerned primarily about independent retailers and restaurateurs. 65% or thereabout of mom and pop businesses do not have an online presence. They flat out don't. And part of the reason they don't is because they're afraid of it. Part of it is because they don't have a convenient platform, which my firm is working with a partner company on developing. Part of it is because they will tell you that they don't have the time, but that will mostly convert back to, I'm afraid of it. Uh, whatever the reason, 65% of Main Street retailers do not have an online presence. And omnichannel is the future. We have got to get our Main Streets online. Sharon talked about the fact that it, it builds loyalty. I am not a big online shopper. The few places, and that part of that is just generational, but the few places where I shop online are places where I know how things fit, where I know what the brands are, and where I know that it's easy to send things back. But basically, they are places that have stores where I have been able to develop that familiarity in a brick and mortar. Omnichannel is the future. We have to get our main streets online. And as I say, 
My firm is working with a partner agency on a platform to do that, but I think that's one of the most important things we have to do as Main Street developers. That we, we have to pay attention to all the thing, the other things, good co-tenancies, good landlord relationships, marketing our districts. But if we want our retailers to have a really good shot at surviving, we have to be very, very canny about omnichannel and, and making it happen. And that's all I got. Awesome. I'm interested to hear questions. Uh, Sharon, I'm, I'm happy uh, to read the questions for both you and uh, Kathleen. The first question that we have in is for Sharon's presentation, can she indicate the percentage of rentable space that of the 52 retail stores represented, conversely, the 45 retail store chains that opened? Can you address that? Sure. You know, I'm not sure on I'm not sure what the percents are, but I would speculate that, you know, maybe the closures might be four percent and maybe the openings might be two percent. And again, the openings are going to be less than the closings for a couple of reasons. Um, I do and I'm really seeing this trend now, although I don't have the data but more and more small, independent, locally owned and operated businesses opening as national chain stores close. So the one thing that this chart, that blue chart doesn't, if I can get back up there, that blue chart doesn't show is all of the openings that are independently owned and operated merchants and downtowns, and they absolutely are smaller. Um, they're gonna be quite a bit smaller than these big department stores that have closed, like, you know, as we watch Macy's contract and JCPenney and Sears and Kmart and Macy's, I mean, they, as they're contracting, they're being offset on the count by small businesses that are opening. Absolutely, they are smaller businesses. A couple of things that are happening, as all of you probably already instinctively know, is that in our downtowns, we no longer need 2,000 or 3,000 square feet for each merchant because they don't really need that massive stock area in the back and they don't need a massive office with file cabinets of paper and a massive printer. Everything has become so compact and efficient. We can really work, do our office work practically at the register. So that really shrinks the amount of square footage that is needed. Now merchants can get by with a thousand square feet, 1500 square feet, or even 500 as a smaller kiosk. So that, and that, that applies really across the industry. Go ahead, Kathleen. And that is true also of all the retailers on this list or the other list that we're looking at. In the last 15 years, DSW, Designer Shoe Warehouse, they have been shrinking their stores. Um, 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 lots of lots of stores that would have taken a 10,000 square foot footprint or a 20,000 square foot footprint are going down to half that size. You're also seeing uh, retailers who are making the move from online only, having discovered that they need a brick and mortar presence. Warby Parker is a good example. Warby Parker is setting up stores that are basically product showcases um, and they're small. They might be a thousand square feet. They might be 750 square feet as Sharon says. Um, you see a lot of people who are trying to come into main streets and whether they are chains or independents, a lot of our main street boxes are that's existing real estate, and those are small footprints. Those are the old mom and pops, those are the mom and pop stores of the past, and they never were giant. In Over the Rhine, we don't have, we don't have 10 to 15% of our available re real estate in footprints above about 3,000 square feet. Um, most of them range from 800 to about 1,500, including many of our restaurants. So, I think most of us, as I say on this call, are Main Street developers and our Main Street retailers don't need real big footprints, but also our shopping center retailers are downsizing. 
Yep. So I would make two recommendations for our downtown merchants and our DDA directors and and downtown managers. The first is try to when if you have a 2,000 square foot merchant space try to have two businesses even share the space or have one business operator have two different concepts within that space. So often you'll see, for example, a Hallmark that also has a pharmacy and they share the space or a hardware store could actually have an apparel department and they can share or to have a, a, um, a novelty gift shop that also it has a cafe where you can buy, you know, coffee and, and a couple of snacks and sit and enjoy the day. So really sharing that space and then also imagining that the space in the alley could actually possibly be converted into residential or it could be converted into a studio, a live work kind of um, situation. So this, I realize this is a challenging idea and that in most, in many downtown street level housing in the downtown, even if it's behind the retail, may or may not be allowed even. But it is something that I'm seeing demand for is that if I can actually live in the apartment in the back and run my business in the front, then maybe my rent is, is more manageable. Um, so those are just a few ideas. Were there other also, questions? Think, think yes. about your zoning code and think about whether your zoning code excludes the kind of things that Sharon is talking about, but also small manufacturing artisan manufacturing. I have a client community where one of the merchants said to me, you know, we don't have a really cool t-shirt printing shop in town. He said, we have a lot of screen printers, but they don't do the kind of stuff that my customers want. And I thought, and I, we, my firm had just done a deal with a cool t-shirt uh, manufacturer. And I thought, you know, in some places that is zoned out of your main street, but that kind of artisan manufacturer, and that is the most obvious example, there are many, many others, that kind of artisan manufacturer is a demand driver and you have to make it possible. And as Sharon says, that's a perfect use for a space on an alley. Mm -hmm. Yep. Can you uh, can you give us three examples of how to move um, frightened merchants online? Is that for me, I think? Um, Either one. First of all, we have to have a platform. There really isn't a platform out there right now. And it has to be, it has to be navigable, but it also has to be something that puts them into a larger context. If I am just a frightened merchant and I am going online, it's like, it's like dropping me into um, a canyon without a parachute. What I need is a way for people to find me online. And that's what I'm looking at trying to create is that kind of channel. And I think what I'm hoping to create is a branded channel where they can go into what I'm calling an Amazon for bricks and mortar. And I'm talking essentially independent bricks and mortar and Amazon for bricks and mortar, but also that um, Main Street Piqua could have its own um, branded channel of that, which would be served by um, my platform so that anybody in Piqua can go to that portal and find that cute shop where they saw the t-shirt that they really liked and they should have bought, and now they can buy it online. And they can go in either through the Piqua portal, or they can go in through the store portal, or they can go in through much like Yelp, a zip code search portal. Um, so the first thing is giving them the portal. Once the portal is created, it has to have tools in it that makes it easy for somebody to figure out how to go online, how to fo photograph their merchandise or upload manufacturer photos, how to, how, to, how to input all that stuff. And then frankly, somebody's gonna have to hold their hand. Yep, I, I agree. I would also recommend, you know, just starting and starting small. Um, I think most merchants could take a photo of their of their merchandise or their display and they've got a special sale going and they could upload that to the city's Facebook page. You know, and then to just fall into this habit where every week I'm gonna upload a picture saying, 
hey, we have a sale going on on this product. And when they get comfortable with that, then they can start, um, you know, promoting that and also promoting the idea of, hey, you know, you can call me, make an order on the phone, and then I will package it for you and you can collect your merchandise. I think merchants, merchants are learning that one um, very quickly right now. Um, they've gotten quite savvy at it. And then it's easy to launch from that once they're comfortable with routinely going in and maintaining those sorts of tools to now start allowing online delivery, um, I'm sorry, online orders and offering delivery and other tools. Um, so that, that is trickier, um, a little bit of maintenance there, and it just takes, it takes dedication and perseverance. And it's, it's going to be tough for someone who's just running the business as a hobby. If they if they do if they're not and um, willing and able to put some time into it, the word that Sharon used there that is so important is habit. It has to be a habit for these businesses. They can have a habit of taking pictures of their ten most most popular items, and and uploading them to something to be defined. They can have a habit of saying the city has offered me a Facebook page and every Wednesday I am going to make use of that Facebook page. They can have any habit they want, but they have to, they have to prioritize this and make it a habit. And, and the interesting thing is once they start to see a return from it, it will be a lot easier to feed the habit. They're afraid mm -hmm. of it at this front. They don't understand that it will, will, will grow their business. They, 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 they understand it intellectually, but it doesn't resonate emotionally. And so they have no real commitment to it. Once they make money from it a few times, it'll 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 become a habit that's a whole lot easier, as I say, to feed. Can we go back and uh, ask about the experience economy too, about moving all of the uh, bricks and mortar stores into experience? What have you seen some of the most success successful ones in small mom and pops? What do you mean by moving them all into experience? So that they're not just waiting for a customer to walk in the door, but they're designing experience once the customer does come in the door or enticing them in the door with an experience or selling a remote experience for them from their merchandise or services. I'm going to use a negative example. Yeah. There is a bookstore of my, uh, of which I am familiar with, which I am familiar. And I, I, I I have never been able to walk out of a bookstore having purchased fewer than three or four books that just they have a magic effect on me, except in this bookstore where I go in and the merchandise is completely disordered. The person sitting behind the counter is is apparently uninterested in pointing out anything to me, even when I ask when the attitude of the bookstore is very kind of blase not kind of glad you're here, we're so excited that you're still interested in reading books, we'd love to sell you some, but just like, oh yeah, mysteries, I think we got some on a shelf over there. Um, that's not retailing. That's basically placeholding. And I think we have got to think hard about who our customer is and what that customer wants. I'm talking to a community right now, which, uh, has the opportunity to do some really wonderful windows. They have a unique resource in their community um, that they can go back and do some really wonderful shop windows. Why does nobody do beautiful shop windows anymore? Wouldn't that pull me into a store if I saw a great window display? Well, there are all kinds of things. And there, this is very heavily studied. If you put the socks on the left-hand side, you'll sell more of them than if you put them on the right-hand side. And that I don't even think that kind of information is even needed. Make your shop incredibly pleasant to, to be in. Display your merchandise in an, in an appealing way and then be enthusiastic about showing it to me, uh, about, about having me in your store. The millennial generation and, the, and their successors like shopping in bricks and mortar. They like a face-to-face -face experience. But if they feel that they did not establish a connection in a particular location, they will not come back. If they yep, come I back, they'll be very loyal. Yeah, Sorry, and I, I totally, 
Yep, I totally agree. And usually when someone asks me, a merchant, how to activate their, sh their shop for an experience, I remind them of the sensations. You know, it's a complete sensory experience. So we don't, not only do we want to see the merchandise, which means having an illuminated storefront and clean windows and displays, but we also want to hear. So that means turning on some music. And then we want to taste. So that means offering, you know, coffee or refreshments or little cookies or even a, a doggy dish out, out in front. We want to be able to rest and socialize. We want to feel socially connected. So that means offering seating, actually providing a bench and a couple of chairs in front of the store and even inside of the store, encouraging people, gosh, if customers can rest for five minutes and just take a load off for a little while, they will resume their shopping making sure that the restrooms are accessible, not, not having the restaurants close, the restrooms um, closed off and not accessible to customers. And then also um, smelling. So just being able to smell, you know, having some, some, a few candles burning or, you know, other sorts of, um, you know, they've got all these um, oils and F essential oils and such that you can use to really just kind of complete that experience as well. So really, and being able to touch. So having um, some sort of a touch experience as well, you know, plunge your hand into a bowl of marbles, whatever it may be, really providing that experience. And I recommend this really for restaurants as well, not just merchants, finding a way to just asking, you know, is there any kind of sensory experience that I can offer that might just um, make it enjoyable, enjoyable for the shopper? such that they feel an inclination to reward me by making a purchase. That's my Two end goal, things. is to have, have the customer reward me for their good experience by buying something. And I think three things based on what Sharon has said. First of all, the last one. This, you give them something, they want to give you something. And the only thing they can give you is a purchase. And that is a subconscious motivator, but that is absolutely crucial. You showed me a good time when I was in this store. I like it here. I really should buy something. I like it here. So I have to pay back for that. And we, yep. most of us have that feeling that we have to pay back. That's the first yep. thing. The second thing is Bath and Body Works made a ton of money based on the fact that when you walked in, I don't care for Bath and Body Works. I, I'm allergic to most of those scents they use, but people would walk in there and they would say, oh, it smells so good in here. And they would buy things because they wanted their homes to have that, that same smell and it was price um, attractive. And so they would do that. And I have forgotten the third thing. That's okay. Were there any other questions for us today? Yes. Uh, another question goes back to the online. If uh, if uh, mom and pops refuse to go online, is that uh, uh, a death sentence? How many years do they have? There's no. It's not a death I, sentence. And and I think Sharon referred to earlier a hobby business. I think they've self declared themselves as a hobby business. And it, it basically, they didn't buy a. They're not in business. They're just they've 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 created a job for themselves. So they aren't going to have an asset. They they're going to be able to readily sell when they want to leave. They probably they probably already capped their income potential. Um, they may be valuable as an anchor in our business district. They may be that cute little store that just keeps going. It doesn't really need to make any money, but they always are open when they're supposed to be open and the people are always pleasant and they they are a, de a destination de demand driver. That's all good. They just aren't going to be as successful as they could be. And that's, everybody gets to choose that. It's not a death sentence. It's just not necessarily a death sentence it's just not accepting um the potential the maximum potential for growth yep absolutely i'm always watching you know what is the what is the profit margin so if i can do those little things i might actually only be increasing my sales five or ten percent 
that might be enough to make my business that much more marginal, you know, that much more profitable. But but again, for a, sometimes these little shops, they really are hobby businesses. They don't understand that it's a front door for online. They don't, you don't really want to grow. They they're enjoying themselves. If they are valuable yeah. in your district, and they are doing a good job and they are good co-tenants and they observe they are observing the rules as i say opening and staying open on the schedule that that we need them to be that's fine we can't save the world yeah one mistake that i often see downtowns um downtown managers make is when they see a business close it's it's so tempting to assume that there wasn't a market for that business so there might have been a clothier shop, for example, and they closed, or a sporting goods store, and they closed. And I often hear stakeholders say, we can't do that kind of business. We tried, and they didn't make it. But the thing to remember is that merchants close for so many different reasons. They're far more vulnerable to, to, to life events. So there may have been a death in the family, a sickness in the family. They may have gotten um they may have a spouse that had a job offer <clears throat> it may be that they just didn't understand how to do their taxes or how to order inventory or how to rotate merchandise how to display things maybe their service level wasn't quite there but if they close it really could leave room in the market for a different proprietor to come in and do another store that that's similar and do it that much better so I always see a closure as, as really leaving a gap, a hole in the market that another merchant could come in and do a, a much better job. They'll come in fresh with high service levels and they'll leverage this omni-channel halo effect and, and thrive. And so sometimes it's just a matter of letting, letting those who are not, who don't really have all the skills that they need to pull it off, um, you know, letting them if if they have to close, it's unfortunate, but recognizing it as an opportunity and not a failure. It's also important to recognize that some of it simply may be a failure to understand trends. And I think the most obvious example of this in the retail discussion is department stores. We hear that all the department stores are closing. We hear that the department store is dead. We see that Macy's is closing stores. JC Penney is going out of business, Sears is going out of business, and we think to ourselves, oh, well, I guess there's just, the department store is just a dinosaur, that's gone, they're gone. Yeah, well, you know what? Target's a department store. It's just, it's a horizontal department store instead of a vertical department store. It came out of the Dayton Hudson organization, which was traditional department stores, and about 20 years ago, the Dayton Hudson organization started a pivot to horizontal department stores instead of vertical department stores. Walmarts are department stores. Um, so sometimes it's just a perception that um, something is dying because we have not looked for what it has morphed into. And that mm -hmm. also is a factor. That's an excellent way to look at it. Um, please type in any other questions you have. If you'll notice in the handouts panel on your control panel to the right, the presentation is in the handouts box. For those of you who were here during the live session, thank you so much for tuning in. Be sure to join us for our next presentation, Preservation in the Age of Pandemic with Ed McMahon tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. Ed is a fabulous speaker. Also, we hope you join us this evening for our Legacy Circle reception with special guest Paul Edmondson, President of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. That will be starting at 5 p.m. and we will be back on Zoom. Zoom has uh, renewed its operations. Um, I don't see any other questions coming in. Uh, Kathleen and Sharon, thank you so much for putting uh, hard numbers to what we see and interpreting what we should have been seeing. Yes. Thank you so much. We really appreciate the opportunity um, and we appreciate the invite and the chance to talk with you today. So if you have any questions, give Kathleen a call. Give me a call. Um, we're here to help.
I do Absolutely. have one more question. I have another question that came in. Maybe you can a answer. Okay. How do you positively convince a long-term community presence that holds valuable real estate space yet is not required to by his current city code to enhance its exterior presence, especially the window storefronts that have hand-painted drawn images and logos? Well, how do you teach an old dog new tricks? I guess is the question. This is one of the real challenges. This is a, 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 a very much a real estate question and, and, and a real challenge in the work we do. And my answer is you have to basically build a relationship with that person and you have to eventually persuade them that it is in their own interest to do it. And some of that can be peer pressure. Some of that can be um, seeing that other landlords are making more money. Some of it can be a variety of things, but but the problem is that uh, the problem is it shouldn't be a problem. the The reality is that property tr rights trump everything in this country, and you have to find a way to establish some form of virtual control. And sometimes that can be by offering to help, but you have to have a good relate, develop a good relationship with that owner, and try to demonstrate that participating is more in their interest than failing to participate. Yeah, and I like to use the seven count, the trying seven times. And seven is a magic number because that's the number of times it takes to convince a child or an adult that an idea was their own idea. And so if you go to approach a property owner or a merchant and talk with them about an idea, it may actually take seven times. Um, it might actually take, you know, seven monthly meetings it might take, you know, seven discussions before they actually start to listen and, and imagine and, and contemplate and consider it and eventually come back to you and tell you that it was their own idea, but hopefully they just do it. So seven times to get a child to try new foods and eventually say that they like it and seven times to get a merchant to clean their windows. And it's and really what seven times really says to you is don't give up right don't give up great advice keep going until it works uh, again yep. thank you so much legacy circle is open to all conference participants and that's 5 p.m and we'll see you again soon thank you thank you thank so you. Much. have a great day everyone